Hey everybody, this is John Buck. I'm here, uh, this is John Buck back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. On this video we're going to talk about two more very basic signals we use a lot. Continuous Time Sinusoids, Continuous Time Exponentials. Spoiler alert, we use these all the time, just like in Discrete, because they are uh, the way Fourier transforms work. That we make, we use these as the ingredients in our recipe to make other more complicated signals, because it's very easy to think about one frequency at a time, for LTI systems. Okay, so you sort of know where this story is going, but I'm going to quickly review basics of continuous time uh, sinusoids and exponentials in this video. So let me switch over to the whiteboard. So again, uh, for sinusoids, we're looking at signals of the form like this. Right, x of t is a times the cosine of omega t plus phi. This could also be a sine. It doesn't really matter because uh, the phi makes it possible to do things either way. This a out in front is the amplitude. This omega is the frequency in radians. And phi here is the phase angle also generally in radians. And so and the, uh, this omega, another way you can see this written sometimes is omega is 2 times f, where this, is, this f will be the frequency in hertz, right, which is the units of 1 over seconds or cycles per second. Okay, so, and, and we've You've been seeing these since high school trig. I could draw you cosine, but you know what they look like, right? And then the other signal we'll look at a lot this semester are exponentials. Right? Exponentials take this form. X of t is some constant c, which is, again, an amplitude scaling factor, times e to the a t, where, again, t is our continuous variable. But, uh, and, and there are two sort of ways these can look, or, or really three if we look at it, depending on whether this a is a real imaginary or a complex valued constant. So this, you know, the value of A changes the behavior if A is real. Well, that didn't come out well. If it's purely imaginary or if it's complex, if it's a mixture of both real and imaginary parts. So let's talk about the real case first. Then the, the sine of A will still determine what the signal behaves like. I can get different looking signals depending on whether A is positive, negative, or zero. I'll create a little room here. So here are three different cases for uh, all from exponential signals with real choices of A for the exponent here with the time, uh, we can see things that grow, things that decay, or things that remain constant. So what I want you to do is think for a moment, based on these graphs, pause the video and think for a minute, based on these graphs, which graph has a, has A equal to zero, which one has a negative value of A, and which one has a positive value of A. Okay, so go pause and think for a minute while you work on that. All right, so hopefully you're back on me. Let me put up the answers and see how you did. So uh, for things that are growing exponentially as t increases, we know a is greater than 0. If they're decaying, a is less than 0. And if they remain constant, that means a is equal to 0. So that it's just that this part, you know, e to the 0 becomes 1, and this thing would just have a constant amplitude of, of, of whatever the value of c was in your equation here. So that's the first simple case. The next one is, let's see what happens when A is imaginary. Right, so in the imaginary case, well, let's say, I, you know, I don't know, uh, let's say A is uh, equal to J times some omega naught. Right, so I can say, what if A is equal to J times some omega naught? I have E to the J omega naught T. Well, hopefully you remember that having seen this before, what do we get for E to the J omega naught T? Pause the video, think for a minute if you need to, but hopefully this comes fresh to your memory. Yes, it's our old friend Euler's identity, and, and here captured in one of the fine memes we had su 
submitted for the uh, class meme contest last term, or the meme assignment. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> e to the j x is going to be cos x plus j sine x, right? So Euler's identity just as important in continuous time linear systems as it was in discrete. We're still we we're, can't forget that we're still going to be using it over and over and over again. Okay, and then you know the same way we can combine e to the j omega naught t and e to the minus j omega naught t to make just the cosine or just the sine where we need to. Let's write the negative form first, right? So I get e to the minus j omega naught t becomes cosine minus omega naught t plus j sine of minus omega naught t. And using the properties that cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function, I can rewrite the negative case like this. And so now I say if I wanted to just be left with the cosine, I could add these two terms, right? If I add this equation to this equation here, the two cosines will reinforce, the two sine terms will cancel each other out, right? So I'll, if I add these together, I'll get that e to the j omega naught t plus e to the minus j omega naught t. And on the other side, when I add them, I'll have cos plus cos, I'll get two cosine omega naught t. And the signs will cancel out. So what's left is I can bring this two over to the other side, right? And this gives me my old friend for cosine. Cosine of omega naught t is a half e to the j omega naught t plus e to the minus j omega naught t. I could do a similar thing for the sine, right? If I take the first equation and subtract the second equation from it, the cosines will cancel out, and I'll be left with 2j sine. Right, so looking at this, then I can say, oh, all I need to do is divide both sides by 2j, and I'll get my equation for sine. So that's my Euler's identity for sine. Okay, so those are, again, just a refresher on our, our old friends for, from Euler's. And then the third case is when I have a is a complex number with a real and imaginary part. So let's see how that works out. Right, so if, if I have a is equal to r times j plus j omega naught, and I plug that into the exponential, I get, and I get, c times e to the, the quantity r plus j omega naught times t, I can use properties of exponentials, right, to rewrite this as e to the j, e to the rt and e to the j omega naught t. So now I have uh, two pieces going on, depending on whether r is positive or negative, this, I'll have an envelope that's decaying, or, well, if, if r is positive, an envelope that's growing, if r is negative, an envelope that's decaying, and meanwhile, what's going on inside it, I'll have a complex thing with cosines and sines oscillating with radian frequency omega naught. Right, so I'll get things that look a lot like things we saw back in circuits. So what I've drawn here, actually, I guess would be the uh, real part for, for, neg uh, for positive time. Without a unit step involved, this thing is going to keep going on forever. So I should be more complete this way, right? So this, this thing would keep oscillating at the same frequency and blowing up, right? But this, this blue dash thing is the envelope. This is e to the rt, assuming that r is less than zero, so that it's decaying away. And this thing inside is oscillating, right, where the period t is 2 pi over omega naught. So the, it's not strictly a periodic signal because the amplitude is always decaying, but we see this oscillation repeats you know, is, is caused by a periodic signal multiplied by this decaying envelope to leave the 2 pi over omega naught. Okay, so those are the main ideas about uh, exponential signals in continuous time, so I'll stop this video here and see you next time.